I hope you enjoyed the uh, weekend. We had some nice weather. Um, I want to keep talking about GUI applications here. And again, it's sort of important to plunge right in and just sort of fight your way back to the surface, right? That's these big systems, you can kind of poke half-heartedly at it and hope that you sort of get some big understanding. But the best way to do it is to sort of dive in and then just Google a bunch of stuff as you get confused until you emerge with some fuller understanding. So, in our GUIs, you need to start with what's called a top-level container. Again, containers are things, it's actually, a container is a class that you typically inherit from. <coughs> containers hold other containers and also hold <coughs> components. And components are the things that we see, buttons and sliders and so on. There are different options for these top-level containers. We can have JFrames, which is one we used already. And again, it provides little red, yellow, green buttons and resizability and things like that. There's also J dialogs and J applets. The applet should be capitalized with an A there. Um, but for the most part, we use J frames in our stuff. Applets are for like being on web pages and, and so on. Um, you cannot put a J frame inside another J frame. So while a lot of things we want to build up in a hierarchy, put a button inside this and put a you know, panel inside that, you can't put two J-frames uh, inside each other because it's added directly to the frame. But really what that does is the J-frames add method adds it to this content pane for you. So it sort of hides that there's another layer in there. Okay. So when I had that label and that button and I said add each to the J-frame, it was really adding to this content pane, uh, content pane, which is a container of some kind. Now a slightly more common thing to do is to make your own pane replacement out of a panel, out of a J panel, and you, you say set content pane to be that panel. And so you sort of have full control at that point over what's going on in this, this larger area here. Okay, so uh, let's look at how to do this a little bit more. So one thing is, once you have a bunch of buttons and things in here, you want them to be in, you know, match some vision you have of what your application should look like and not be like, a label and a button and another label and another button and you know just sort of primitively stretch out. You want to have control over what's going on. So to do that, we're going to use these layout managers, right? So that, you know, like even more stuff. Like I said, there's a lot of things to kind of get control of to do this, this stuff right. So there's a bunch of different named existing layout managers. There's a flow layout that basically gives you a left to right arrangement. There's a grid layout that you set. How, like a table, how wide and high it is, and there's like cells you can put elements into. There's a border layout that basically gives you uh, little areas up, up around the border and then a big center area. But maybe we should look at uh, the documentation a little bit. And so, for example, this is a border layout. This is what's called a box layout. It also does like rows and columns of elements. Something called a card layout that I kind of forget what that does. <laughs> the flow layout is actually the default layout. So if you just add stuff to the content pane, it's going to be a, a flow layout to, uh, to begin with. Um, Would the flow layout ever do a new line? Yeah, so if you start resizing this stuff around, it flows to match sort of the space back. around there. So, the point of these layouts is, again, your first instinct in all these things is to say, I want to put a button at x equals 10, y equals 10, another button at x equals 100, y equals 100, and that's one way to lay stuff out, but you lose any flexibility when you're on a different size screen or anything like that. So the more mature way to do this stuff is to use these layout managers to kind of provide the look you're hoping for, but it can resize itself a little bit when you find a different device of some kind. This sort of strange grid bag layout. Uh, and a grid layout, and a group layout, and a spring layout. So there's all these different layouts. And again, at a certain point, you just learn a couple. And then when they don't do what you want it to do, you go and research these other options and you know, see if that helps you a little bit. So there's a lot of options, and, and um, they all slightly different behaviors. All right, so all these things exist in a hierarchy. So for example, I might have a J frame that contains a J panel as its content pane. 
Inside the J panel, I'm going to set a border layout because that's some look I want. I'm going to add a J toolbar and a J panel to that border layout. And within that J panel, I have another layout that sets out more things like buttons and labels and things like that. So you just get this like kind of crazy layer, 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 layer to kind of force it to be something like what you want it to, to look like. And so don't get scared by that. It's just, you're just adding things together. You know, one panel with two panels inside it, each has a different kind of layout so things go vertically or horizontally. And it seems like a lot of busy work and it kind of is, but it's kind of the control you need to have to make this stuff uh, work the way you want it to work. All right, so anyway, here's the yeah, low layout, grid layout, border layout. Those are like the common ones I use a little bit. Now the trick in some ways is to start to see little clusters of components and figure out what kind of layout maps to these kinds of things. So here's a layout. And notice it's not all in one line, right? It has some structure. What, what are the chunks you might see in this little little application. Like if you were going to design its hierarchy of layouts, what would you have to do, do you think? I know I just told you like two seconds of what each layout is, so it's not surprising to me that you're not immediately, you know, seeing things. But there's, at least tell me, even without knowing any layouts, what, what, are, what, is, what is a chunk here that's like different than the other ones? One of these is not like the others, right? Maybe there's like two J panels in the frame, one for the press button me and one for the don't wait and wait because they seem to have different formats. All right, so you're saying that this is a chunk. Yeah. It could be a panel of some kind. And what kind of layout does it have inside that panel? Grid. This grid layout, right? If you just, yeah, so this is, looks like a grid layout of some kind. And then these kind of are flowing across. <laughs> So anyway, when I see it with my slightly more experienced eye, <laughs> uh, certainly I see this two by two grid layout on some kind of panel. And then once you have this thing, these other two just kind of flow next to it, right? So they're all arranged in a line here. So this thing is, and this thing and this thing are all in a line. So this is basically a flow layout, left to right flow layout kind of thing. And so to build this up, you would have to collect these together onto something with the layout and then add that thing to the flow layout, add this button to the flow layout, and add this thing to the flow layout, and you get something like this, okay? So that's what takes some practice, sort of either recognizing an existing layout, and someone says, hey, I want you to make, you know, you're some uh, freelance UI developer, and someone says, I want something that looks like this, and you have to start picking out, you know, oh, let's see, that, that's, you know, I can build it by doing these things together. Or you have your own vision in your head, of course, of what you want this to look like, and then you have to figure out how to make that a reality. And you'll sort of be surprised at how long it takes for the stupid button to go where you want it to go. You know, you sort of forget what's going on here. And this, this, this hierarchy is like 10 layers deep, so you add it to the wrong layout manager, and you know, it gets kind of confusing. So you have to keep pretty kind of careful track um, what's going on with all this stuff. But anyway, this to me is the skill with building these UIs, is seeing stuff and recognizing how to break it into pieces. And, and in some ways, this isn't so far off from how, what we've been doing in our basic programming problem solving, right? We have some large problem, and we're looking to see, can I break this into a few steps that can get me to the end goal? And so it's the same kind of skill in my mind as, as solving a large problem in a method with code, except we're doing it sort of visually with these layout managers. All right, so just think of it as another language you're kind of messing with. All right, questions on that part before we move on? Like, kind of get in the... That's, that's like the, you know, that's the, the approach you need to take with all this kind of stuff. <coughs> Any questions? And of course, you know, half of it's, you gotta actually learn how to do this in code and that takes some time. All right, so this J panel is basically a generic container to hold things. It doesn't provide any real functionality on its own, right? It's just an organizational tool. Um, and typically, for a lot of these things, we're gonna, make a new panel, new J panel. We're gonna make a new layout that attaches to that J panel. We're gonna make a bunch of new GUI components, buttons and sliders and so on, add those to the layout, and then add the layout to the panel, and then add the panel to your J frame or whatever else is in the hierarchy. So just when you're working on this kind of stuff, think about all the things you need to do, right? You need to <coughs> you can't just make the panel, you need the layout for the panel as well. And then you need to add all the components to it. So 
There's all these little steps and little checklists you've got to get used to doing as you build up these uh, applications here. All right, so let's, um, let's make a memory game. Well, you probably played a memory game with cards, right? You lay out um, some grid of cards, and you turn over two of them, and if they match, those, those stay turned up, or you take them off the board as a, as a, you know, as a winning thing. Um, and if not, you turn them back over again, and then you turn over another card, another card, and see if they're matched. And basically, you're trying to remember where all these things are located in a grid, and if you're good at it, you, know, you, you actually remember it. Um, so this kind of thing we can do pretty easily with uh, our interfaces. And so let's see. Uh, so what's the GUI going to look like? Let's say we want to have a 4x4 four four set of cards. Uh, we're going to end up with why am I going to draw all these things? <laughs> we need four by four things. And when it first comes up, we don't see the values contained on those cards, right? They're going to be just like some generic question mark kind of deal on all those. And then we get a click on one. So I click on here, and some hidden value shows up. And I click on another one, some hidden value shows up. It's not a match, so nothing good happens there. And then, you know, there's different things you can do here. You could make them turn over in a second, or you could, you know, think of different ways to hide them again. But I'm going to just say, let's click somewhere else. These go back to their hidden state. And then we show the value under that one. So you basically click twice, and then when you click a third time, the, old, the last two turn back over again, and they're hidden. So you have to use your memory at that point, right? What kind of thing does this seem like? Uh, a grid with a flow on each. What does around? this thing look like? Uh, a button, right? I click on it, and it does something. So, and in fact, it has some sort of text on it, buttons. You could set text like quit or whatever on it. Uh, so this is a button. Is it exactly a button? So when I click on a button, it flashes and sends a click event to my action listener. When I clicked on a button here, something else happened. What happened also? It flipped over, it flipped over the card, essentially, right? It changed whatever the text was there. So this, this is like a button, but not exactly like a button, which means we're going to do what? When we're writing code for it. <coughs> if something is like a button, <laughs> but not exactly a button, we inherit from it. We extend it. So we take the button functionality, and we add some new capabilities to this thing to make it act like a memory card thing. <laughs> right? So to build this game, we're going to make a, a new kind of button. That's our button that acts like this. And then, as you're saying, this whole thing What is this thing here? Well, let's, let's pretend So what is the whole outer thing? That's that J-frame thing, right? And inside the J-frame, we have the content area and that's going to be J panel with a layout, and this layout looks like a grid. All right, so we have enough information to kind of get started here. Uh, so let's let's start by making the the button. All right, so a memory button extends J button, and so it has these clicky things it knows how to do. And what does a, what does a, uh, what does one of these cards have to retain, have to remember as this game is played? It has a value that it's, that 
it, the card has a value, right? Like a six or a five or four or three, two, one kind of thing, right? So it has a number of values. And in fact, there's this parameter secret value. So we need to make a private, uh, what do I call it here? Integer secret value. I wouldn't really call it a secret, I guess, because as soon as you click on it, you know what it is, right? But uh, the value that it holds, we'll call it secret value. So when we construct a memory button, we want to store some value in this instance here, right? So we're going to say, hey, make yourself as a one card, or make yourself as a two card kind of thing. And so I'm going to say that secret value equals this parameter secret value. All right, so we, we're going to make a new memory button. We say new memory button with a one. That one gets sent to this underscore secret value. And then we assign that one to the instance variable secret value here. It's not used. OK. Now, what am I missing here? This is a J button, right? So I need to make sure that I also initialize the J button part of myself. And so I'm going to call super. And it'd be nice to know a little bit more about like what the J button constructors are, because I don't really know them that well. But there is a J button constructor that takes in a string and makes that the label that's displayed on the button. Okay? So I want to start off by making this a hidden card with a question mark on it. So when we first deal them out, they're all face down. We don't see the secret values because they're secret. And instead, we show a question mark, so there's something on the card, so it's not just like a blank square where they were like, what is this thing we're supposed to do here? Okay? I could have a press me or something like that, but I don't know if that would fit on our little tiny squares. All right, so super is going to construct the J button aspect of our memory button and give it an initial label and then also have this augmented capability. The extend part is that we're going to store a value in each button so each one knows what, what number they're at. Now, I'm going to do one other thing, set font, a font to be a new font. And there's a font called dialogue. And it is a plain font. And it is bigger than the default size. Really, really what I really wanted out of all this was that font size 24 so that we have our button, and it's not like a little tiny question mark in the middle. I want it a little bit bigger. Okay. So again, that's something that was like, like that text is small. I want bigger text. How do I do this? I have no idea how to do this. Because I still really don't have much idea how to do this. So you Google it, right? Java Swing, make font bigger. And then someone says something, and you're like, that looks plausible. Let's try it, and it works. And that's cool. That's what that's what you do, right? You just say. I want to do this. You know this thing is all powerful. It will, anything you want to do, it knows how to do. And so don't be shy about asking the world about how to do it. So this set font, what's the purpose of that first parameter, the, the dialogue right there? Uh, what's, the, what's that function? Font? Font. Well, font is a class of some kind, and it knows about, oh wait, what am I doing here? Oh, this is, ends here, yeah. So I'm setting a font to a new font. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, size 24. What's dialogue? That's the name of the font. Like we're used to seeing <coughs> Times New Roman or something like oh, that. Okay. Is it is yeah. plain like you could put bold or italicized? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Oh, okay, so that's the. Okay. Yeah. So it's like the type of font. Oh, man. So I'd, ha I would have to look up like what fonts are typically part of the Java yeah. swing system or something like that to know what I could type here. Okay, and then. Well, I'll leave it. Okay, so. So this can make memory button. Now there's something I want to do. I want to be able to, when I click on it, I want to show the value that's there. And when I'm done with it, I want to show the question mark, hide the value, all right? So I want methods that, that do that for me. So this is, so again, why, why we're inheriting is I want the basic button stuff, plus I want these new things that I can do. So I'm going to make a public method show value. And in here, I want to basically make a number appear. So I can 
This is really this dot set text set. Oh boy. See a lot of options here. None of them are set text. <laughs> but I must inherit from something I can set text. I'm pretty sure I can set text. Uh, set text to some string. Okay, so set text takes a string in and displays that on the button. Now, what do I want to actually show here? When I show the value, what do I want to show? I really want the secret value. But the problem is there's not a set text that takes in an integer. Okay, so I need to convert from this integer value to a string. And there's a lot of ways to do that. We've seen like integer, parse int, or that goes the other way, right? Uh, so there's a lot of choices. One common one that you see is let's make an empty string and concatenate in this secret int value. And concatenate converts that to a string for us and then merges it with this empty string to make a string that's just a number, all right? So that looks kind of, to me, that looks ugly, a little hacky, but I see it around enough that I kind of wanted to show this because you're going to see it somewhere else. Um, I think it'd be better to actually call a method that says take this integer value and make a string out of it. But anyway, this says make an empty string, turn this into a string, add them together. All you're left with is that one thing converted to a string. Can I get that? Uh, if you're concatenating it as an integer, uh, would it still inherit like, the following? So yeah, once that's a, once that's a string, Okay. That gets sent, so strings don't have their own like bold properties and stuff, right? <laughs> so it gets sent to set text. The set text method looks and sees what font properties apply to it and displays it based on that. So there's a whole complicated thing going on underneath there, right? Now, to make this be a little bit cooler, um, if you click and it's just like there's this blank white square that the question mark turns to a seven, it's not that noticeable. So I want to get a little more Exciting. I'm going to do a set background. It takes a color. And again, I'm like, what does color mean in Swing? I got to go look it up. But there is a some predefined colors that you get through through this color class, right? So color is a class. What kind of thing is yellow in this class, do you think? So classes have things in them. What is this one? It's a, it's a static variable in the class. So somewhere in there, there's a color, yellow is the name, equals probably new color, and some numbers that mean yellow, right? So it's making a new thing. That's, and so somehow this color class has predefined a bunch of static variables that we can access through the color class that are sort of named like names instead of uh, just a bunch of numbers, okay? And this will make the background of my button be yellow. And this needs to have a void on it, because we don't return anything, but we do something. All right, questions on that? So again, it's more like, you know, I was making, you know, actually I was adapting, this game has been around for a while, but I was adapting this game, and you're like, this is kind of boring. I want something more exciting. I want to make this like a flash, you know, some color when you turn it over. And you're just like, Java Swing, J button, make, make color or something like that, right? And you, you go through a bunch of Stack Overflow things and you find one that looks plausible and you try it out and it works and you're happy, all right? So you don't learn this stuff by reading a 600 page manual about all the different options that are available on this stuff. You do it by baking some projects and building your skill set as you I want to try cool new, new things on it. All right, if we show a value, what else do we need to be able to do? <coughs> hide a value. So public void, hide value. And I'm going to set the background color. Uh, in this case, I want just some default background, and you're allowed to just pass in null. So that makes it sounds kind of scary, right? Like, like, there's no color, but it, it's smart enough to know what to do if there's no color. It does some, some default kind of deal. And in this case, I want to set text to, so when I'm hiding it, what do I want to show on the button? That question mark thingy I had, right? So 
Actually, I can just do that directly. I was about to do my little concatenate thing again, and then I was like, no, I don't need to concatenate a question mark with an empty string in this case. All right. Um, so set and show and hide. And my guess is that at some point, we need to be able to extract the value out of this class so we can compare it with another card and say, are they both sevens, are they both sixes? And just showing it on the label is not enough for the computer to know what value it is. And so we need to actually provide kind of a little more standard getter here, um, get value. And I'm just going to return the secret uh, value in this case. All right. So kind of makes sense as a class here. We're going to act like a button. We can change what's shown on the label. And we can change the background color. And we can know what the secret value is by using a, a getter. Notice I don't have a setter in this case because if these cards were changing values, it would really be, that'd be a tough game, right? That all of a sudden, you know, that seven turned into a three, so you thought it was there, and now it's something else. And so we don't want to even allow that capability by, by providing a setter. Now, if you type this in, there's a little yell thing here, and it says, the serializable class memory button does not declare a static final serial version UID field of type log. And I'm like, so what should I do? Let's do a quick fix. Add default serial version ID. And it adds this weird thing. Private static final long serial version UID equals an, a long is, is an integer that has more values. And so this says this one is a long. All right? Don't worry about that. That's just sort of being part of this Java swing kind of environment for now. At some point, maybe we'll sort of talk, talk about it. But it's basically, it wants to know how it can dump these things like to the hard drive in some sort of meaningful way, and it needs some sort of ID that says what kind of thing this is. And it's going to complain and just sort of do that quick fix and, and just go with the flow in this case. Okay, don't worry about it. I know you want to worry about it because it's long and scary looking, but just sort of just do it and be happy and don't just ignore it. OK, so we have a memory button. Now we need our memory gain. All right, and our memory gain we want to have all this stuff here. And I want to talk about one thing here. So in our memory game, we have a lot of choices as to how to use this Java swing kind of stuff. We can make a memory game class that inherits from JFrame. So it is a kind of JFrame. Make one that has a JFrame instance variable. That was the first way. When, like two lectures ago, I showed making a little simple class, and we just had a main method. And inside the main method, I said JFrame, JFrame frame equals the new JFrame, and then add a label and add a button. So we use it through composition by adding an instance variable to the class. Or we can inherit from JPanel and make the JFrame in main. So we sort of say there's this JPanel thing that acts like the game, and then the JFrame is going to use that in uh, some other program. These are the kind of design things that you're sort of, you know, either you blindly do stuff and it, and it never causes you any trouble and you, and you never like think about these issues at all. <laughs> and that's a bad idea. You need to be thinking about these kind of things. How do I structure this thing that makes the most sense? And it's not like a super right answer. So it's also like sort of dependent on a bunch of factors. Uh, so in this case, This was actually the way I used to do this, inherit from JFrame. And then I decided, well, why do you ever want to inherit from something? You want to inherit from something so you can have a collection of these things all in some like polymorphic behavior and reuse like this JFrame in some other program. If I inherit from JFrame, I can't insert it in another program because JFrames can't go inside JFrames. All right? So JFrame is always at the top level. And so if I inherit from JFrame, I can make a specialized class that, that acts like a JFrame. But it's not like I can use this memory game and stick it in some other program as like an example of a memory game as part of some larger other program. If we have it inside as an instance variable, that's sort of OK. But uh, then it's hard to get access to all the parts of it from outside the class. And what I want to do is make our game be a JPanel 
and we build it up as a J panel with all the good components, and then we insert it into another program that has the J frame and use it, use it there. Don't, I'm not saying this that you should be like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I get that, you know, like, but I want you to, I mostly want you to be aware that these are the decisions that at some point you just need to start making once you're more familiar with this system and think about how you're going to build up these, these, these programs, all right? So I'll show you this last way and you can see if you like it or not and then just sort of follow that template um, a little bit. Okay, so let's, let's just kind of start writing some code here. All right, so we know we're going to have a collection of our memory points, <coughs> and we want to put them in some kind of layout. Uh, so my class memory, really memory game, extends a J panel. So I'm thinking of this game as like a big <coughs> chunk of stuff that I can again insert inside a J frame somewhere, and we're going to implement action listener because we're going to be clicking on these buttons and those buttons are going to generate events. We want the game to decide what happens. Are these two matching? These kind of things, right? So you also have to decide where we're going to respond to events. I could respond to, I could have made the memory button respond to action listener, but they all live in isolation. They only know about themselves and what secret value they have. By putting it here in the game, then I can say, oh, there are two things clicked, do they match, and so on, and kind of have a little higher level control over what's going on here. All right, so let's, let's kind of start in main making some stuff. So uh, I'm going to make in here a J frame called main window, and that equals a new J frame that I title memory game. And typically, again, you know, we have to pack the main window, the J frame, around whatever components are inside it. And then I need to set it, uh, main window, uh, set visible. So we actually see it to true. All right, that's enough to actually maybe run something at this point. And once again, we have our fabulous, super tiny application here with no components inside it, right? But it has a title. Hey, publish it. Get beta feedback. Now the problem is here if I, oh, I quit anyway. I guess there's some default behavior there. I thought I'd have to set that on or exit kind of thing we do. Um, but maybe not. Well, it might, it's still running. Oh, it's still alive here, yeah. I quit it here. So I want to, remember we had that main window uh, set default close operation and I set it to J frame exit on close. And when I run it again, you know, it's really bad this lines up exactly with the underlying thing. I'm always closing Eclipse <coughs> thinking that, you know, like, that's not there, and then, I, you know, because there's Eclipse, right? So anyway, I hit that, and now that went away down there. Okay. So there's, there's these little things you learn you have to add to these things to make it all work kind of okay. Now there's another, well, never mind, I'll wait on that for a minute. All right, so we have our application. What I really want to do now is make an example of a memory game memory panel and construct it. I didn't fill out the constructor yet, so nothing really going to happen here. And I'm going to set on uh, main window, set the content pane to be the memory panel. So again, the memory panel is going to hold really the game. And at a certain point, I say, hey, let's take that whole thing and slop it into the J frame. So J frame just basically contains our game for us. Okay. And let's, I'll do one other thing here, main window. So you can say, you can give some hints to uh, the system. Say, I want a new, when I, when I start up, kind of make me this size, not whatever smallest possible size you can imagine making kind of thing. And I can set this by setting, creating a new dimension. 
This is really just a size, not like a ooh, fifth dimension kind of thing. And so I want it to be 300 by 300. All right, so there's quite a bit of sort of startup costs here, but again, grab something that works and just kind of copy it for the most part. Okay. Now what needs to happen in our memory constructor? So again, what is this memory thing? It is an extended version of a J panel that has a layout and has all these buttons in it. All right? So we need to, in the constructor, make those things for us. So what's the first thing I need to initialize here? I need to say I'm a panel, and I need to call super. Super. OK. So it doesn't have a title, so I just call an empty constructor on super, and that's good enough. So I'm now a JPanel, sort of officially. I now want to create a layout. So I'm going to make a grid layout. Grid equals a new grid layout that is, I basically say what kind of table size they want, you know, four by four, because there's going to be four cards across and four cards down. All right. And then to that grid layout, I'm going to make a bunch of buttons and add them one at a time to the grid layout. So to do that, what value should go in the secret values for these buttons? So I heard random numbers 1 to 8. There's 16 cards. Why 1 to 8? Because there's pairs of cards, right? So there has to be one pair that's 1, 1, another with 2, 2, and 3, 3, 4, 4. So at some point, it'd probably be nice to get 16 <coughs> ints that are really eight pairs of numbers in some sort of, then shuffled all up into some random order, right? So I could do that all here, and write a bunch of stuff, but I want to, again, break down my problems a little bit. So I want to, let's just, now that I recognize that I want this set of stuff, one, one, two, two, three, three, but all scrambled, let's solve that in a different chunk of code somewhere so I can kind of concentrate on that and test it and make sure it does kind of what I want. So rather than just put it all, you know, all in the constructor, let's break it out a little bit. So with the grid that you've created here, would we not want the instance variable grid for the pane rather than having a new one here? Or all right, so why, why not uh, up here make a grid layout grid instance variable and initialize it here? When should a component be an instance variable or a local variable? I'll give you five bucks later for that question, right? No. So we talked about this a little bit last time, but use a local variable if you just want to create this thing and kind of forget about it. Like you don't need named access to that variable. A layout, you hardly ever need named access to because it does its own thing. You're not poking it all the time saying be four, five by three now, be six by two, or something like that, right? So we can just create that thing, add it to the panel. The panel knows about it, but we don't need to know how to get to it anymore. Um, if you want to access it easily, make an instance variable, start button. Start button has some unique behaviors. We want to know if we press the start button. And so uh, if we're going to use it in the action listener, then it's good to make it an instance variable where we can access it easily. If it's just something you make local variable and add it, you can still get it through this e source thing, right? So down in the action listener, you get the event. The event knows what object triggered that action. And so in this case, you say, tell me which thing triggered this action. This comes back as an object type, the most general thing it can be. We already know it's a button, because that's the only thing we have. We're going to cast it to be a button, so we can use button kind of behaviors on it. But we don't know exactly what button it is. This is just a reference to whatever button was pressed in, in the game. <coughs> we don't need to know it was like memory button three or something like that. Okay. So again, you'll start seeing, you don't want to just crowd up your class with a bunch of instance variables you never access by name. But if you start, so I'd make them local for the first part in the constructor, and then all of a sudden you realize you need to know about it somewhere else, then shift it to be an instance variable, sort of as a need to know kind of basis kind of thing. All right, so let's, eclipse, okay. So 
Um, we, we're talking about trying to break off some code to give me six, eight ints in pairs scrambled. And I have actually written such a thing. Uh, I made it an array list because maybe sometime we want like a five by five game or a six by six game. It would be nice to be able to kind of have this thing grow to be the proper size that we need. And this thing basically uh, creates a new array list. We count up from one to however many pairs we want, one to eight in this case. We add them to the array list. And then there's some nice little code that does a shuffle for us. So instead of me generating a bunch of random numbers and saying, do I already have two ones? I don't need one anymore. Do I need, you know, I only have one one. I need another one. Get sort of complicated. Just make the things we need. Add them twice because we need a pair of them, and then shuffle it. Okay, and I'm going to assume that does a good job for me because I didn't write it. If I wrote it, it would be a bad job. And then we return it. Now this method is private, so only code inside the class can access this private code. This is because I don't think this generate secret values is part of the useful interface for being a memory game. Other code is not going to use my memory class to generate these kind of these random numbers, right? This is some internal helper method to help me structure my code a little bit. And so I made it private so my constructor can use it and other code can use it. But I'm not saying anyone else outside of my class needs to be messing with this code, right? If you start finding you're writing some big system and you want to generate pairs of randomly shuffled numbers a lot, you should split it off into some sort of like hard shuffle class and make it a method there that's publicly accessible or something, but not uh, necessarily uh, just make it public right here, right? So public stuff is how other code interacts with this class, and I'm saying if I'm a memory game, you shouldn't be asking me for my pairs of random numbers. That's not, like, why would you need to know about those things? So we make it private, so I can use it, but other code cannot. Can you just scroll to the right just for the box, please? Thank you. So he's passing, you know, I want eight, car, eight pairs kind of stuff, right? But you might say, oh, what's the downside of making it public? Well, then it's part of this like published API when you get web pages that show what's in this class. I read about it and I have to learn and I think, then I, is this important to me or not? You know, and you start wondering what's going on. So it makes it private unless you think it's really needed. All right, so I'm going to make my secret values array list of integer. Remember, I have to use the object integer rather than int because. Array list sold objects, not primitives. Uh, I'm going to call it secret values. And it's going to be <coughs> generate secret values from one to eight in pairs, shuffled. So notice I've sort of, again, collapsed down some complexity to one line. And we assume that works. And we don't have to think about it too much when we're using it. And then I'm going to go uh, equals zero, uh, less than 16. That's kind of bad, but we'll just use 16 for now. I plus plus. And in here, I'm going to make a new memory button. 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 Uh, equals a new memory button. And that new memory button takes a single value in its constructor, takes that secret value as it's, uh, so we're saying, give me a card that has a one in it, give me a card that has a three in it kind of thing. So I want to pull out of secret values one of the values. And actually, this is sort of done in a little bit of a funny way. It's not the way I would have done it, but uh, oops, where am I? Value. All right, so this is saying, take the, the first item, <coughs> remove also returns the value that gets removed. So this gives me the value that's stored in the first location in the array list and then gets rid of it. Uh, so the next time you through, you get, you get a new value kind of thing. I, I know there are already 16 values. I would have just pulled them out one at a time and said, get value at whatever, uh, and not remove them. I don't know why. Uh, I, I inherited some of the code here. All right, so we're going to take that button and we're going to add the button. 
And when I do this, it's adding it to the panel that I am, right? A memory game is a panel, and so I'm adding it to the panel. And it adds it. You don't have to say where it goes in the grid. You can, but it just stacks them, you know, fills up the grid as you fill it up. And so grid layouts know how to cut handle a bunch of items. And all right, that's sort of a start. Let's see if we run this if anything happens. <laughs> something, something was different than when I was running this last night about its sizing or something. So that's where the, the initial size was like that. So notice, you know, the grid will try to put it where you want it, but it doesn't force it if you make it be, you know. <laughs> kind of thing. Now notice, nothing happens when I click on this, right? What do I need when I click on something to make it do something? I need one of those action listener, uh, action perform uh, methods. Okay, just enough time to get that started here. So I want to, to the button, I want to add, what do you call that thing? Add action listener. Add action listener. And it's this panel class that's going to define the action listener. So I'm saying this is what the action listener is. And down here, I want to do some stuff when I'm clicking. So I'm going to take what was clicked and cast it to be a memory button, because it just doesn't think it's an object. So memory button uh, e.getSource. And yes, that seemed like one long line of stuff there. <laughs> and then for now, I'm uh, but all bad stuff happening there. Uh, show value. I'm gonna make it show itself. Okay. If I run now. Click, 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 click. I could do it. Come on. Oh, wait, that too. I was like super genius there. All right. Uh, there's one thing that's missing here. What's not happening? The, the what? They're not going back. Yeah, but something else that's. It's not turning yellow. It's not turning yellow, right? That's the cool thing I wanted. So there's something weird about how Java is interacting with these some machines, and I need to set one other mysterious chunk. Um, so let me just show that so you can read. I need to try a UI manager set look and feel to a UI manager Get cross platform look. Is it going to complete? Look and feel class name. <laughs> and if I don't work, don't worry, we're so close here. Just hold on one second. Uh, print, stack trace, sure, whatever. Uh, nothing. All right, if I run it now, I'm basically saying, Hey, do some stuff so you behave properly on different kinds of machines, all right? And this kind of thing that you, oh, shoot. <laughs> yeah. Too many? Oh, wait, there's like, wait, I got, I got a double one there. Then I need one more. All right, we're running now. Oops. What am I doing? That's Python. We, whoa, what the? <laughs> this was not happening last night when I was testing. It was all nice. Okay. Now it's yellow. Life is so good now. All right. You'll play with this a little more in lab once I maybe figure out what's going on with that layout manager. Oh, we never maybe. 
I don't know. We gotta think about that. <laughs>